My name is Andre Wiedenkamp and I'm going to present to you our work on dynamic algorithm configuration. To jump right into it, uh, here's a running example where we have an algorithm that we want to configure across a set of instances such that we optimize a certain objective. If we use something like algorithm configuration where we treat the algorithm as a black box, what we would do is just trial different parameter configurations and see how that influences the objective. In the end, we would stick with the configuration that gave us the best objective value and always apply it to all instances that we will come across. But you can see quickly from the example, this is not always optimal to do. Instead, you could take also instance information into account. And in this setting, you wouldn't just look for one well-performing configuration, but for a set of well-performing configurations. And on top, learn a selector that allows you to find a mapping from parameter configuration to instance to improve the objective. And uh, here in this example, you quickly see this performs much better already than just standard algorithm configuration. And you might ask yourself, why would we need anything else? And this is best answered with this example, because in AI in general, we are dealing with a lot of iterative algorithms. And if we just treat these algorithms as a black box and assume that they just need this one parameter configurations and never go through different stages, um, then we uh, could just simply use algorithm configuration and for instance, algorithm configuration. But in practice, because of their iterative nature, they go through these different stages uh, and thus potentially different parameter configurations are optimal at different stages. So here's where a, a dynamic algorithm configuration comes into existence. It doesn't just adjust the configuration um, to the instance at hand, but also per time step. And how we do that is <clears throat> just schematically, we start from some default value, run the algorithm for a few steps, and we uh, generate some statistics over these few iterations that it uh, ran for. And this gives us a state of the algorithm. So we see how the algorithm has progressed. Um, and then the configurator can observe this state and decide well, the algorithm performed poorly or performed very well and adjust the parameter accordingly. Then we run the algorithm for a few more steps, get a new state and adjust the parameter accordingly. And we do that until the whole instance is solved. And in this simple example, you can see this is much better than just always taking the same parameter value. And what is crucial here is that we need to go away from the view of an algorithm as a black box and view it more as a white box. And if we do that, this allows us to formalize the optimization as an MDP. So uh, what we have here is then a state space and the state space is exactly encoding how the algorithm has progressed since the last iteration. Uh, and the action space uh, allows us to select the parameter value for the parameter that we are optimizing or configuring. Then there's the transition function, which tells us how states are connected in this MDP. But in practice, we don't need to know about these connectedness of the states because we can still learn um, or solve the MDP without knowing the transition function. But what is crucial is to have the reward function such that we can learn uh, which configuration works well for which state. And um, you might ask yourself now, okay, so I see we can con uh, configure per time step, but how do we get the configuration per instance? And to do that, we have to contextualize our MDP. And contextualizing the MDP just means that we now have a set of MDPs with a special relationship because the MDPs share a common state and action space, but have different transition and reward functions. And to get the idea, just imagine an algorithm with a heuristic component and two instances. On one instance, the heuristic traverses the algorithm very quickly through the state space because it can solve the problem instance very easily. But on another instance, it struggles and only makes very little progress. And that's how these different instances influence the transition and the reward functions. Now to schematically show you how we could learn through reinforcement learning to solve such an MDP without knowing the transition function, um, it's very similar to the example that we saw before. We just start from some default that gets us a state and the uh, reinforcement learning agent reacts with some uh, action. So setting the parameter to a certain value, 
which gets a, a new state and the reward, which can be used to improve the uh, internals of the reinforcement learning agent such that it gets us better estimates over the actions. And we do this over a set of instances because we want to learn not only how to adapt per time step, but also across instances. And to make it easier for the reinforcement learning agent, we can do the same thing uh, as done in, for instance, algorithm configuration or algorithm selection and take meta features as part of the state space to make it very easy to distinguish these instances. To evaluate our uh, framework, we designed benchmarks that allowed us to gain insights into a variety of settings. And there are many uh, settings that we looked at, but um, out of time constraints, I'm only going to talk about these two because I think they nicely drive home uh, uh, the fact that we're actually uh, learning to configure per time step and to uh, adjust to the instance at hand. For that, we uh, designed the sigmoid benchmark. Here, the configurator has to more or less approximate a sigmoid function when it has a very limited action space. So in this example, it has to approximate a sigmoid function when it has only two actions. So approximating the sigmoid by a step function. And on the y-axis, you have the reward, whereas on the x-axis, it's the time step. So the optimal schedule here is to start with playing action one for the first four steps, and then at around step five or at latest step six, you switch over to action zero and you get a better reward with action zero. And the nice thing about the sigmoid functions is it's let, it lets you easily encode instances by either shifting the inflection point or playing around with the scaling factor. Okay, so what we did is we sampled 100 uh, of these different sigmoid functions as training instances and evaluated different configurators on this setting. So again, on the y-axis, we have the, re the reward and on the x-axis, the number of training episodes. In one training episode, each of the systems was always exposed to a sigmoid function and the sigmoid function had 11 time steps. So the maximum achievable reward here in the setting is 11. We evaluated three reinforcement learning agents, DQ and Epsilon Grilli and DURS, where, uh, which are all variants of Q-learning, but only DQN used uh, deep function approximation. Static here is always playing just zero or just one, and thus it can only achieve a reward of 5.5 because it will always be correct in half the cases. PSMAC is a variant of SMAC that allows you to output parameter schedules and not just a single parameter value, but it's still a black box and does not know how to adjust to the different instances. Whereas the three reinforcement learning agents are capable of learning to adjust to the instances and also to configure per time step. So the DQN is able to recover the optimal policies to so get the reward of 11, whereas the tabular ones, Epsilon V and URS are struggling a bit but they're definitely performing better than the other two baselines. We also saw that uh, the tabular Q learning agents struggled to uh, generalize to unseen test functions, but that is to be expected with their tabular nature. However, the DQN still is able to solve all the uh, test instances and the performance only slightly lags behind that of the performance on the training set. Now to wrap up, we presented a new meta-algorithmic framework and demonstrated that this framework is a generalization of prior frameworks. So we can recover algorithm configuration by always playing the same action uh, or same configuration at each time step, and we can adjust to the instance at hand. We demonstrated the effectiveness of the framework across a variety of different settings, which I would refer for most of them to the paper. Finally, I would like to thank you for watching this video and I'm looking forward to your questions, and I would like to give credit to the image sources that I used in the beginning. Thank you very much.